Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Today, we've selected a show from Tasmania and start by looking at the ruins of the penal settlement at Port Arthur. And we meet Rudy Hansel, a woodcarver who works with Hewan Pine. We filmed the platypus, one of Australia's most unusual animals. And at Tunbridge, we visit a musical museum. We find the mystery carver responsible for these unusual hedges at Oatlands. And at Bishno on the coast, we go crayfishing for these succulent delicacies from the ocean. So, here it is, our taste of Tassie. <laughs> Tasmania has many historical links with Australia's colonisation and is a dream place to visit for those interested in Australian history. Convict built buildings and bridges are scattered all over the island state. We're beginning our Taste of Tassie here at Richmond, 24 kilometres from Hobart. Around 1807, Hobart town was suffering a severe famine. The wheat crop had failed in New South Wales and supply ships were having difficulty getting through from England. As a result, the settlers had to go out and hunt their own food. They were hunting emus and kangaroos. And by doing so, they opened up new country. This region here, the Richmond area, is one of those areas that they opened up. Settlers came along to the Coal River, and because it was suitable for growing wheat, they cultivated the banks and started up their own crop. It was so successful that it later provided food for the whole of the colonisation of Australia. It was known as the Granary of Australia. And because of its early start, Richmond contains buildings and other structures which go back to the very early days. One of those is the bridge here. Built in 1823, this stone bridge represents the oldest stone bridge built in Australia, which is still standing. The bridge was constructed with convict labour and meant that coaches could pass without delay between Hobart and the east coast and later to the Port Arthur penal settlement. The town grew rapidly and in 1830s was the largest town in Tasmania. There's a legend that the ghost of one of the convict overseers who was beaten to death and thrown off the bridge by the prisoners for his torturous treatment of them still haunts the bridge. This all adds colour for the visitors, but the local tourist authorities hardly need such stories to attract people. Not only does Richmond include the oldest bridge in Australia, but also the oldest Catholic church. St John's Roman Catholic Church was opened in December 1837 and includes in its grounds the grave of a four-month-old son of an Irish political exile transported to Australia for rebellious activities. Wherever one turns in Tasmania, reminders of the convict days are not far away. Probably the most visited of all of them are the ruins of the Port Arthur settlement. Here, the most beautiful building erected is this church. Although only a shell now, it's possible to see what a grand construction it was. It was begun in 1834, and took two years to complete. It was never consecrated because it was used by several denominations. It certainly occupies the most impressive and picturesque site at Port Arthur. After the settlement closed in 1877, several bushfires were allowed to burn uncontrolled through the area, leaving a lot of buildings in ruins. Even the town's name was changed to Carnarvon to try and remove the stigma attached to Port Arthur. Gradually, a tourist traffic developed as a craze for collecting old leg irons, bricks and convict-made articles became popular. Today, it's Tasmania's most popular tourist attraction and under the control of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Story penitentiary was originally a granary and later converted to a prison as the demands for more room at Port Arthur increased. Probably the best preserved buildings of the old convict settlement are those of the Round Tower Guardhouse. Built in 1835, this stone lookout post stood directly above cells which were used for convicts awaiting transportation to Hobart for execution. Although trials were held at Port Arthur, no executions were ever carried out here. 12,500 men and boys served their sentences in Port Arthur, but no more than 7,000 convicts at one time. 
Port Arthur is situated on the Tasman Peninsula in the southeast of Tasmania. The peninsula is connected to Tasmania by a narrow strip of land called Eagle Hawk Neck. A cordon of dogs and soldiers guarded this only escape route. The convicts were too frightened to swim across the channel because of the rumour of man-eating sharks that had been circulated by the authorities. However, this didn't stop some of the convicts. A few did escape by swimming. Port Arthur is probably the most famous of all Tasmania's tourist attractions, at least those that fall into the category of being uh, connected with the convict days or stone buildings, whichever way you like to look at it. Of course, the convicts that came here were the more hardened type of criminal, the ones that had committed a second offence since they'd come to the colony and had had a pretty ferocious reputation, although conditions here weren't all that bad. Some of those criminals were rehabilitated and they became quite useful citizens in the community. One such man, a stonemason, literally carved for himself quite a reputation in a bridge at Ross. Today, the bridge attracts a lot of visitors, situated as it is about halfway between Hobart and Launceston by road, although it's no longer on the highway. Daniel Herbert completed the remarkable carving work on the stone bridge and earned himself a pardon for his efforts. The bridge was a long time in construction and it's believed that a good deal of the rock from the local quarry which was intended for the bridge ended up instead in the more prominent buildings of the town. Daniel Herbert liked the Ross district and settled here once free and now is buried in the old town graveyard. His grave is marked with a stone that he carved himself. Ross's old world charm and appealing character lies in its streets of Georgian architecture. Outside the town hall is a stone step used to assist ladies alighting from coaches, as this was the coaching stopover on the journey between Hobart and Launceston. The old coach house is now a restaurant serving Devonshire teas to visitors. Not all buildings of historical interest are connected with convict days. The Methodist Church, one of the most impressive structures in Ross, was built in 1885. At Hadspen, not far from Launceston, we're reminded of the part which free settlers played in the development of Tasmania. This grand old house has been beautifully preserved as an example of the way of life of well-off settlers. Entally House was constructed in 1820. Most historical links with Australia's colonisation had their beginnings in Hobart, for in the old days it was the only port of entry into Van Diemen's land. It's well known to most Australians these days as the finishing point for one of the annual sailing classics of the world, the Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. These waters have seen sailing ships of all kinds, from modern sloops to the earliest square riggers of the past. Well, since those old square riggers sailed into this harbour with their human cargo, Hobart town has certainly grown into a thriving city. It could be said that many of the settlers which came to this new land were gamblers, gambling that here they would find for themselves a new kind of life. And I suppose you could say they were lucky gamblers too because it paid off. Of course the convicts had no say in where they were going. They weren't gamblers. Today Hobart Town is still famous for gamblers. Hobart was the first place in Australia to have a legal casino. Rest Point Casino overlooks the waters that brought the first settlers to Australia. What a difference they would see if they came into Hobart Town today. Next, we look at a hewn pine. Tonight on Disney, Baby's Girl runs into the face of danger. Evening, Ori. And the crocodile legend begins to grow as Davy tries to rescue his secret love from a fate worse than death. What does that man want with my Ori? He's alone, surrounded by the enemy, and no help is on the way. Uncle Toby's presents a real crocket cliffhanger. The exciting conclusion to... <laughs> This is a hewn pine tree. There aren't many hewn pines left growing in Tasmania these days, although at one time all the east coast and some parts of the west coast were covered with hewn pine. The timber from the hewn pine is ideal for building ships because it contains an oil and that makes it very resistant to water. 
It also makes it an ideal timber to work with as far as wood carvers are concerned. And it makes a nice piece of wood to work with when you're wood turning. And it's this side of hue and pine that brings us to Tasmania this time. We're still in Hobart and have come to meet wood carver Rudy Hansel. Rudy Hansel and his wife Pauline are shopkeepers, but these days it's more than just a corner store. A great many visitors come to see and buy some of Rudy's handiwork from the small gallery which they've added to the shop. Hewan Pine is a uniquely Tasmanian timber, and a few years ago a competition was run to encourage people to develop uses for the timber in a way that would attract the tourist dollars. Rudy entered the competition, and although he did not win any prizes, the experience started him on his way to developing an unusual and different woodworking form. His only experience with wood before was making children's toys, like tables, chairs and rocking horses. But as soon as he started working with the hue and pine, he discovered that the varied patterns and colours in the timber gave him natural art form. From there, the idea developed gradually until today he works almost every spare hour he can in his small workshop and talks of making it a full-time occupation in the near future. And start sanding. After cutting the rough shapes with a bandsaw and taking off the corners with a sanding disc, all the work is by hand. It can take many hours of work, working with finer and finer papers until the smooth finish is achieved with oil. And that's why it'll actually transfer it from that one to the other one, it'll give you the actual I can go ahead now. There are no artificial colours used. This fish has given an eye by embedding a piece of darker coloured dowel into the timber. After highly polishing the piece of timber, it's sealed with a quick drying lacquer to bring out the richness and colour of the wood and its grain patterns. Fitting the finished works to backing boards and similar mountings is just as important to Rudy as anything else. He carefully selects the backgrounds to take advantage of the natural grain. Each piece of timber is chosen with great care. Rudy says that when he looks at a piece of wood, he doesn't always know what he's going to do with it. But after two or three days, he can usually come up with some idea for that particular piece of wood. He reckons hue and pine is one of the nicest woods he's ever come across. He believes the colourings and patterns in hue and pine are what make it so interesting and different. Most of these finished pieces are purely ornamental, but to anyone who appreciates fine workmanship, they're certainly worth having. They represent an unusual souvenir from the island state, and Rudy at the moment manages to sell all he can make. He's refused offers to turn out thousands of pieces for mass sale in tourist shops because he feels that it might lose its individuality if he became little more than a machine. At the moment, he derived great pleasure from the work, and it also pays reasonably well, although some of the larger pieces take so many man-hours that he could not possibly sell them for their real worth. By far the most elaborate pieces he's created are the sailing ships. This one stands half a metre high and is complete with details like cannon and flags and sails. But for Rudy, the simplistic stylized shape of the swan brings out the natural beauty of the hewn pine and that is what he likes all of his creations to emphasise.
Next, the platypus. Having a bad day? Traffic's a nightmare? Kids playing up? Well, stop. Here's the answer. Dr. Fink Knuckles' all-new TV Wonder Cure. The guaranteed boredom buster... ...are so common in Tasmania that it's rare not to see one when out at night. This is a common ringtail possum. I've got an apple for you. You're a bit close, The children love feeding the brush tail that we found in a tree near our campsite. Mm -hmm. Although possums are common and easily encountered, one animal is also common in Tasmania but not often seen is the platypus. They live in many of Tasmania's freshwater lakes and streams. Underwater, the platypus is extremely agile. It fossicks for small aquatic animals along river beds and lakes. Platypus come out of their burrows at night to search for food. Platypus can be found in freshwater streams along the coast from North Queensland throughout Eastern Australia to South Australia. They're not found in Western Australia. It's been suggested that the desert probably stopped it spreading further westward. The platypus is a monotreme, an egg-laying mammal. It shares this distinction with the echidna. They're the world's only two monotremes. Night time is the best time to find a platypus because they're nocturnal creatures. This is the female. The female and the male take it in turns at burrowing a hole into the bank of a river where the female lays the eggs and then she incubates the eggs over a period of two to three weeks. Then when the young are hatched, they, uh, they feed. She doesn't have nipples, but they feed on the, on the mother by rubbing the belly here until the milk secretes through the, the pores of her skin. And, that, uh, and then when they're big enough to leave the, uh, the burrow, they follow her and then they live on worms when they, they grow to adult size like this one is. They're very soft as you can see. And this one's the male. It has uh, on its hind leg a spur which is poison or has a poison gland on it. And if you get uh, jabbed by that spur, it won't kill you but it'll make you very sick. The poison is manufactured in a gland in the thigh. It is injected when the spur pierces the flesh. The poison produces similar symptoms to a snake bite and can hospitalise a man for several days. The poison is fatal to small animals. In museum tests, rabbits that were injected with a large dose died in 90 seconds. When the first specimens of the platypus were sent to England in 1800, the scientists there refused to believe such an incredible animal existed. They said it was a fake. It wasn't until 1802 that the first complete specimen was shown to prove that it really did exist. Many animals were trapped and killed for their beautiful fur. This practice was soon stopped and the platypus is now totally protected. Platypus use their duck-like bills to sift through the mud on the river and marsh bottoms in search of small aquatic animals and worms. A flooded creek is helping the platypus here by driving worms to the surface. Platypus live in burrows excavated in riverbanks. The burrows are about a half a metre underground. The burrows vary in length from 5 to 20 metres. A nest of reeds and grass is constructed in a chamber at the end of the burrow, and breeding takes place in the spring. Two leathery shelled eggs are laid in the nest about September or October. The mother platypus curls up and holds the eggs close to her body until they hatch in 10 or 12 days. The young ones are only 20 millimetres long when they emerge from the egg and the mother continues to hold them close to her body where they suckle her milk. The platypus does not have nipples. The milk oozes through special pores on the belly and is sucked from the skin by the babies. The babies are kept into the nest until they're big enough to come out into the river. They're usually about four or five months old before they take their first swim.
worms are the favourite food of the platypus. Being active creatures, they eat a lot and spend many nighttime hours in search of food. The platypus lacks true teeth, but has molar-like crushing plates. They crush worms and other small aquatic creatures in a similar way that birds crush caterpillars with their beaks before swallowing them. Big worms like these take some time to crush. This female is using her front paws to hold the worm. In a 24 hour period, platypus only spends about two hours in the water. surprised how quickly this platypus accepted our presence. Even the strong lights didn't worry it for long. It even stops eating for a casual scratch. We're happy to say the platypus seems to be one Australian animal that is safe from the threat of extinction. Its habitat is not at the moment in danger and scientists are happy about its situation. So it seems one of the world's most unique creatures will be here for future generations to see. Next, a musical museum. Good afternoon. ...in Tasmania to take a look at an unusual collection of old musical instruments. They're the property of Derek Dean and he set them up as a museum. The building which houses the museum is open to the public every day and is known as the old time music parlour. Inside we find Derek Dean at work practising his special skills as a restorer of old musical instruments. Derek began his craft in England and was restoring old instruments for collectors in Sydney before he moved to Tunbridge in 1977. This movement is about uh, 1880 and uh, I've just finished a uh, complete restoration and I'm just straightening up the remaining uh, pins to be uh, adjusted. On this cylinder there would be about uh, 12,000 pins and uh, as the cylinder revolves so these pins pluck the uh, teeth on the comb and um, if they're in the right sequence of course it plays a tune. Once I'm satisfied that everything is uh, correct there, then it goes back into the box, like so, and uh, the final screws just tighten the movement in the case, and uh, the lid is closed, and that's the end result of four weeks' worth. The unique aspect about Derek's collection is that the visitor receives a personalised explanation and demonstration of each instrument. The music box was playing now, it was about 1880, and uh, these were very popular. It was about the only form of music in the home at that time, until the invention of the phonograph uh, by Edison in about the 1890s, 
and the music box makers tried to compete with Edison uh, and they made a disc music box with interchangeable discs which you could just simply take the, uh, the one off that you just played, place on the one that you would like to hear and snap the shaft and switch it on from the front and it will play the tune for you. popular in the 1880s was the organist and this is the Celestina works on a paper roll and you just simply put the roll here hook it onto the spool at the back and turn the handle to play a tune <laughs> again and simply turn the handle and it plays quite a popular tune. Another interesting instrument is the Tanzbar accordion uh, made in Germany about 1910 and these were very popular and very, very easy to play. In fact, if you bought one brand new and took it home, within about two or three minutes of unpacking it, you could play it just like this. What you did was to undo the end, slip a paper roll into it, and it just played itself. Also in Germany, about the same time, the triola player zither was invented. And this instrument plays mechanically and it uses a perforated paper roll. When you turn the handle, the instrument plays this section mechanically. You play the bass with the left hand, reading off the side of the roll what bass chords to play. of instrument was given away free of charge if the salesman could convince you to buy 12 or more cylinders. And about 1902, this type of instrument, the Edison Home phonograph, was very, very popular. The large horn here um, didn't really do much except impress people. This model is the Passé Actuel, made in France about 1924, and it's purely acoustic and it's quite sensitive. There is no electrically electric amplification, and the speaker here is just a paper cone. And this little one here is not a camera; it is in fact a gramophone, made about 1925. This is a portable instrument which uh, you would probably take with you on picnics and once you found your picnic spot then of course you would set up your gramophone just like I'm doing now and within just a few minutes you could have music, uh, your favourite music and uh, just play along and play your favourite tune. From here, it proved to be a short jump to modern turntables. And thanks to Derek Dean and his unique collection of the old-time music parlour at Tunbridge in Tasmania, we can see how it all began. Next, we investigate some carved bushes. The historic little town of Oatlands, like most in Tasmania, has a quaint charm and character, created by the abundance of old and well-preserved buildings. 
Governor Macquarie named the town in 1821 and commented that it was a very eligible situation for a town when he selected the site. The countryside is said to have reminded Macquarie of his native Scotland and of the grain which grew there. The town since 1821 has flourished, situated as it is on the main highway between Hobart and Launceston. Its most recent fame has come in the oddest way with these sculpted trees which we tracked down in the main street. We're on the trail of the tree carver and after a few inquiries we're told where to find other examples of topiary as this is known. The dictionary finds topiary as the art of trimming or training shrubs or trees into unnatural ornamental shapes. By now we know that a man named Jack Cashons was a toparian and we headed for his 1839 vintage cottage. A car bush at the front door confirms that our information is right and in no time we find ourselves invited to a cuppa with 64 year old Jack. Yes he confesses he is the carver but recently arthritis has caught up with him and his doctor has asked him not to continue. Jack is delighted to explain how it all began. I know how I started trimming the trees. Well, I used to be patrolman between Oaklands and Tunbridge. And uh, Mr. Pitt, the state highway superintendent, asked me to trim the little bushes up along the side of the road as you tidy the road up. Well, one day I'd been trimming the trees and it came to lunchtime and a uh, uh, patrolman's job's a lonely job and uh, I had nobody to talk to and there was a nice little bush growing in front of the car. So I got out and I trimmed it out in the shape of a rooster. Well, he took on the uh, mercury people, wrote it up and then the head engineer, he encouraged me uh, in the job and I cut out all sorts from then on. Kangaroos and giraffes and pigs and anything I'd think of I'd cut out. I was trimming the trees one Saturday morning up the road to St. Peter's Pass and I uh, trod in a hole where they took a telegraph pole out and I broke my leg. Well, after several months in plaster and then uh, to the hospital, I just had to give all this tree trimming away and here I am. Uh, just an old invalid pensioner now. Jack, of course, is well known by now for his topiary, and we set off down the highway to take a look at the effect on the motorist. All sorts of animals parade by, standing like statues. Some are so lifelike that a motoring hunter once saw a stag one night and hurriedly braked his car, grabbed his rifle and began stalking the bush. The story didn't mention if he was on his way home from a party or not. Since Jack started his unusual pastime in 1960, over 4,000 letters from people in different parts of the world have reached him, all expressing delight in his animal parade on the Midland Highway. The steam train cut out of a large bush in an open paddock makes you take a second look. 
you could be excused for waving to the engine driver. But now that Jack is unable to keep up the work, will this parade that lightens the motorist's drive disappear? We asked Jack. Uh, the public works uh, uh, flying gang, they come through and trim the spouts off the ones that I got cut out. And I hope they continue on because it, uh, it's helped them boost the tourists uh, to Tasmania. Uh, everybody looks forward to, to seeing those trees. Hope Jack's art form will continue to brighten up the roadside on the Midlands Highway near Oakland in Tasmania. Next, we go cray fishing at Bishano. The biggest art theft in Australia. You have the reputation of being one of the most picturesque parts of the coastline, and uh, we'd have to agree with that. Photographers and artists who visit Bishano claim it's one of the most picturesque spots in Tasmania, but it also attracts a large number of spear fishermen for the waters are amazingly clear. For fisherman Steve Davis, this bay has been the place of work all his working life. For the last five years, he has specialised in cray fishing and now operates on his 10 metre boat, the Wendy Ann. Shawnee, Steve's dog, is his constant companion on the cray fishing trips, which take place every day of the five month season. On one occasion when Steve was washed overboard, he called to Shawnee to stay on board and look after the boat. The boat ran aground and the dog wouldn't allow any of the rescuers on board until Steve, who had fortunately swum ashore, arrived to relieve his faithful guard. The fishing grounds are quite nearby and when the Wendy Ann steams off under automatic pilot, Steve prepares the bait for the crayfish pots. Steve insists on fresh bait and says he wouldn't put any bait in the pots which he wouldn't eat himself. The pot hauler, operated off the engine, soon hauls in the pots which were set yesterday. Steve's boat is licensed to operate 20 pots, which is enough for a good day's work. The gauge we use, which is 105 millimetres there for females and 110 for bucks. We put it on the cray, measure between, between his eyes and the hard part of his back, which is there. The gauge, he's well oversized, that one. And with this one here, you can see the measure goes well over, well under the, he's well undersized, this one. And uh, he's got to go back to next year's crop. The crayfish, which are large enough to be retained, are kept alive in the hold. The hull has holes in it to allow the fresh ocean water to pass through and keep the crayfish alive. Each pot is quickly rebaited before Steve moves off to gather up other pots. There are 18 crayfish boats operating out of Bishno, and half of those are one-man setups like the Wendy Ann. All others are larger vessels. The annual catch of crayfish in Bishno is around 81 tonnes. Even the Wendy Ann can carry up to 1,200 crayfish in her hold at one time. Fish now produces a large fish catch, including rock cod, tuna, carp and flathead. But it's the crayfish which have made Bishno so famous for the tourists. In the early days, Bishno was a sealer's port. Many different ways, but the, the, 
Ray's mainly don't like walking on steel. The uh, timber pots are, we find most effective. This is the echo sound that we use. Um, it shows the bottom where the craze is, like there's a reef there, where it comes up, I'd set a crabbish pot in there, or in the gully there. Here where the reef, at the bottom of the reef, the craze is under the shelves, also in there. Probably up the bank here, in there, would be another good place. Stand here watching the echo sounder, until the echo sounder shows the gully, in the right spot where the craze should be. Uh, let the pot go. Steve Mercy's pots to fresh locations every day. When all have been placed, he returns to Vishnu for today's catch. The crayfish can be kept alive in the hold of the boat for long periods of time and are frequently sent alive to Melbourne and Sydney markets. A certain number of these tasty fellows, though, are destined for the local dinner plates, as most of the motels and hotels in Bishno offer a cray bake to their guests. This popular pastime has become something of a tourist ritual, with huge baskets of crayfish cooked in large cauldrons, while the appetite of the crowd is urged on by the aroma. All the fair has a party atmosphere about it, and often stays in the minds of the visitor as a highlight of their Bishno stay. Served with salad, they say nothing compares with Bishno crayfish at an evening cray bake. Delicious end to our taste of Tassie. Tasmania is one of those places which always seems to offer something different every time we go there. Yes, it's always different and never dull. A bit like our shows, eh, Mike? Well, I hope so, but uh, on that note, uh, we better leave you, and thanks for joining us today. Bye. <laughs> Tease.